individuals are starting to join. If you're new to Teams, you may see um, three dots um, to the left of your camera icon. If you click on that, there'll be options where you can turn on closed captioning for this meeting. Um, and we'd also love to give a friendly reminder to everybody to just please mute your lines as we're going through um, the presentation today. And we will have time for active discussion. Um, as the presentation is occurring, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we'll gather all of those for our discussion at the end. And there are links in the chat um, as uh, you can see on this slide here. If you would like to follow along, there's a full assessment report as well as some interactive maps that you can check out um, either after the presentation or during this discussion today. Um, I would uh, if uh, Matthew, if you want to go to the next slide, please, we have just a few um, grounding rules that we'd like to share with everybody today. Um, you can read them on the screen. We just welcome you all to be active um, listeners today, keeping an open and, and non-judgmental mind um, and to, to share even if you feel like you may not have the right words today. Um, this will be a safe space without judgment. We are here to learn um, together and, and grow together. We are uh, very excited to be presenting these findings to you all today. Um, and as a reminder, um, this uh, presentation will be recorded so we can share it with you afterwards. Um, and with that, I would like to turn over our introduction to uh, Andy Sutton with the University of Minnesota Extension and their um, RSDP program for our introduction today. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm just checking to make sure, yeah, mic is on, camera is on. That's great. Um, so my name is Andy Sutton, and I'm the Executive Director of the Southeast Regional Sustainable Development Partnership at the University of Minnesota Extension. And I, we are um, one of the supporters of this project, and so that's why I'm so honored to be here today. And I get to the pleasure of welcoming you all and providing an introduction to this project, the Olmsted County Food Security Assessment, that you will be learning about this afternoon. Uh, so I want to begin with an expression of gratitude. This project was initiated and carried through thanks to a remarkable collective effort undertaken by community leaders in Rochester and Olmsted County, regional and statewide institutions and local government. And each and every one of the individuals I'm about to thank has committed numerous hours to this project. They have met weekly to share their expertise and channel their passions for food access and equity into the solutions-oriented analysis you will hear today. And they've engaged in an important and sometimes difficult conversations about the overlapping systemic challenges that exacerbate the problem of food insecurity in Olmsted County and around the US. So I first wanna thank our advisory panel members. They are Anna Oldenburg, Community Health Specialist from the Olmsted County Public Health Services. Lauren Jensen, Sustainability Coordinator for the City of Rochester. Eric Tarr, Youth Services Library Associate at the Rochester Public Library. Susan Draves, Regional Coordinator for the Southeast Region's University of Minnesota Extension SNAP Ed Program. Channel One Food Bank Executive Director, Virginia Merritt. And Channel One's Food Security Project Managers, Kimberly Fox and Angie Gee. And then Ann Debsetter, who was Interim Executive Director for the Southeast RSDP before I came on board. And then there are two others I want to call out in particular. So first, I want to express a special thank you to Kelly Ray Kirkpatrick, who is Rochester City Council Representative for Ward 4 and co-lead for this project. She's also a member of the advisory panel and has been integral to this initiative's success. And then I want to express a particular gratitude to Matthew Gabb, who's a recent graduate of the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning Program at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School for Public Affairs. Matthew was the project lead and the powerhouse behind this research and report. 
the intersectional perspective that he applied and the assess um, to the assessment made the final report and set of recommendations truly rich, nuanced, and urgent. And last, I want to acknowledge those who are doing the work on their own that we don't know by name. I want to recognize your labor and care and thank you for the work that you do every day. And now it's time to share a few words about the project. So here we are gathered virtually again as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to affect our lives and communities in new ways. <coughs> it's a powerful time to be discussing food insecurity, excuse me, in Olmstead County. <coughs> when due to COVID, excuse me, <coughs> the number of food insecure people, <coughs> some things in my throat, countywide increased by over 30% in 2020 alone. So taken at face value, this number is extremely troubling. But what, what is even more troubling is the way that this food insecurity is manifesting unequally across race and class lines. So in the presentation and discussion to come, you will learn more about the roots of this deepening hunger divide and how racism, economic segregation, transportation access, SNAP and WIC utilization, housing costs, and health insurance access are integrally connected to food insecurity. But you're not only going to learn about the challenges. Today's presentation is absolutely full of solutions because there's so many creative and innovative ways that people have already come together to ensure equitable food access, and there are so many more opportunities to for further positive change. That is the beautiful thing about this report, the large number of actionable solutions. So I hope that today's presentation and discussion inspires you to share your experiences and ideas and get involved. This assessment is a launch pad, and we hope this meeting today inspires you to join local efforts to combat food insecurity and help them to grow. So I welcome you to participate actively in the Q&A and join us for breakout sessions at the end where you'll have a chance to talk together with fellow attendees and the community leaders who shepherded this project over the last year. So thank you all and I'm really looking forward to the conversation to come. Thank you so much for that introduction, Andy. And now let's turn it over to Matthew Gabb, who will go through our uh, 2021 Olmsted County Food Security Assessment. Thank you so much, Andy and Anna, for that great introduction uh, to the work that we've all been able to do over the last year and a half on this assessment. Um, as mentioned, my name is Matthew Gabb, a recent um, urban planning grad from the University of Minnesota uh, who was brought on to kind of lead the efforts of this assessment and I'm just really excited that so many people are here today and that we're able to um, to really kick off kind of more of the, the public facing work um, and all the work that we can do together as a community um, when combating food insecurity. Um, I just really briefly, of course, want to thank the, uh, the Southeast Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships once again, particularly uh, Anne and Andy and the entire board as well for their generous support uh, and help along throughout this uh, entire process. So what I'll be briefly chatting with y'all about for the next 20 minutes or so is just a brief introduction to the assessment. Um, and if you, you can see in the chat, as well we had on the first slide if you want to kind of follow along uh, during this presentation because obviously it's a it's a very long full report and we couldn't talk about every single thing or we'd be here for you know for a few hours but i really encourage you as we go along to peruse through that um, and let it inform some of your questions and our discussion and kind of some of what you see here today because this presentation again is just just going to be a, a taste and a morsel of all the uh, the richness that we were able to put together in that report. Um, so some of the other things from the assessment that I'll be highlighting, uh, some of the history and demographics uh, that Andy mentioned, uh, as well as some of that key data, as well again, those uh, that solutions oriented work that we're really looking towards uh, that Andy also brought up as well and some of these call to actions and key takeaways. So the first 
thing, obviously, is why a food security assessment and why now? This work was really started in around 2019 when many of the community leaders in Olmsted County, who are, you know, many of whom are on this call right now, um, started thinking through, you know, what are ways we can improve the food system in Olmsted County? Uh, and knowing that to ensure that interventions are targeted and intentional, we need to know what food insecurity looks like and where is it most prevalent and what are the factors that are impacting it uh, that are specific to Olmsted County. And then, of course, as those conversations were happening then into early 2020, COVID-19 hit U.S. shores and this work became more important than ever, uh, as, as Andy had mentioned as well. Uh, you know, in, in Olmsted County specifically, uh, we saw that 30% increase of people who were food insecure. Uh, Pre-COVID, we saw around 7% of county residents who were classified as food insecure by Feeding America and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And that number jumped up to 9% um, just in a couple months in 2020. Uh, with job losses and supply chain issues and loss of income uh, in communities, I mean, across across the nation. Uh, and food insecurity, um, for those who, who might not dig deep into USDA documents like I do often, uh, they classify that uh, as either an individual or a household who has uh, limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods, um, or they have limited or uncertain ability to acquire acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways. Now, uh, this is a trend that is also common, that is present, excuse me, not just in Olmsted County, but essentially in every community in the United States, is that children have higher rates of hunger and food insecurity than the population at large. Um, so pre-COVID, we saw around one in 10 children in Olmsted County were considered food insecure by the USDA. And that number uh, jumped even more than it did for the general population, all the way up to 14% um, in 2020, uh, which also mirrored you know, a similar pattern again in Minnesota um, and in counties across the nation. And you know these jumps in food insecurity rates due to COVID are concerning, not just because it means more people have been hungry for the last two years, um, but because it's a reversal of a trend that we've been seeing where in 2019, food insecurity in the United States was at its lowest level in over 30 years. Um, you know, where we were just overall at around 11% 11, 11 of the population um, at large and 15% of children. Um, in the United States were food insecure, um, which we haven't seen levels like that since the late 1980s and early 1990s. And as we can see um, with the estimates that recently came out from Feeding America for 2021, you know, as we've kind of started to, some communities have started to recover economically um, from the, the, pan, the, the still raging pandemic, um, we are still, of course, not seeing those 2019 numbers. So a lot of the work over the next couple of years is thinking through how can we return back to these historic, to that downward trend that we'd particularly seen since 2014. Now, of course, uh, as Andy alluded to, food insecurity both before and in COVID has not been felt equally depending uh, on your household. Um, and you know this what I'm showing on this slide here is what's known also known as the racial hunger gap, where we see that um, you know households and individuals of color have food insecurity rates anywhere from two to three times higher than white individuals in the United States. Um, so we can see that you know around eight percent of white individuals, are uh, considered food insecure, were considered food insecure in 2019, um, but it was 16% of Latino, 19% of Black, and nearly 25% of Native and Indigenous individuals in the U.S. Um, were food insecure um, and not sure where the next meals might be coming from. And as with many disparities in the United States, these of course persisted uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, what you can see on these graphs here, which can, are, I'm sure for some of y'all might be a little hard to read, um, but we can see that obviously, you know, food insecurity increased, you know, from 2019 to 2020 for everyone, but we can see that 
you know, across these, which it shows, this just disaggregates by black and white into uh, individuals in the United States. Um, we see that, you know, black households and individuals still have much higher rates of hunger and food insecurity than um, white individuals and households. And it's very difficult to see on this graph, but actually, if you're looking at the 2020 and 2021 projections from Feeding America, um, white individuals are actually recovering from the peak uh, in the 2020 peak of food insecurity slightly faster um, than, than black individuals and households. Uh, and of course, we we highlight these racial disparities because it's re it's paramount that we keep these top of mind and central to our work as we work to tack as we work to improve and tackle food insecurity and make sure that our food systems recover from COVID and then improve so that they're even better than they were uh, in 2019 and earlier. So um, that's kind of you know the reasons for the food insecurity for the food security assessment. Um, so I'm going to very briefly talk through kind of how Olmsted County's food system got to where it is today and what it looks like today and some of the the history uh, again that Andy had alluded to as well. So of course I would be remiss to not acknowledge of course the original stewards of the land that is now Olmsted County, uh, which is the traditional homelands of the Sisseton, Wapakuti, and Wapaton bands of the Santee, Dakota, uh, and Sioux peoples. Um, and of course, you know these uh, these tribes and peoples are still very much in, still in Minnesota today and in Olmsted County and are um, you know. A, very much a part of all conversations that we are having around the food system and what an, an equitable and just food system looks like. Um, and that, and you know, a just food system looks like one where indigenous voices, of course, are at the table and, and are centered, um, you know, not only, uh, you know, because they, you know, they're, you know, in our communities, but also because, you know, they have, you know, deep knowledge going back thousands of years of, you know, how to steward land and grow food in Southeast Minnesota. And then another aspect of kind of the history of Olmsted County that has really impacted what our food system looks like today, particularly the disparities in the food system, um, was the practice known as redlining uh, during the New Deal after uh, the kind of in the wake of the Great Depression, which for those who might not be as familiar, uh, part of the New Deal was to uh, improve home ownership um, in order to build household wealth and help households better recover from the economic calamity of the Great Depression. Um, so the federal government mapped over 200 cities, including Rochester, whose redlining map you can see on the slide there, and assigned residential neighborhoods grades based on their mortgage security, which would then determine whether or not uh, in households in those neighborhoods or who are trying to buy homes would be given a, a loan um, from the federal government, which at that time was essentially the only way to get a mortgage and a home loan. Uh, and so there were four grades, um, A, B, C, and D. The C and D ones are, you know, were deemed uh, hazardous and dangerous, and those are the yellow and red neighborhoods you can see on the map. And in virtually every city that uh, had redlining maps from the federal government, those yellow and red neighborhoods had higher proportions of black residents, immigrants, um, working class whites, um, higher Jewish populations, um, because those populations, of course, you know, were um, racistly seen as compromising the values of homes and properties. And I'll show this in just a moment here, but we still see these patterns of redlining um, reflected in housing segregation today, which then impacts where our grocery store is located, where our polluting factories that might um, damage the soil and prevent gardens from growing, um, where are those located and things like that. So jumping forward to today, I'm looking at the racial demographics of Olmsted County. Um, Olmsted is one of the more diverse counties in Minnesota. It's currently around, I believe, 20% of the county are people of color. Uh, and for those, uh, BIPOC is an acronym that stands for um, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. So just kind of a more over, uh, a more encompassing um, term. Um, and 90% of the county's BIPOC residents today currently live within Rochester city limits. Uh, and just one note on the map that you're currently looking at on the screen, 
Um, these are the 33 census tracts that are within Olmstead County. Uh, a census tract is the smallest geographic unit of measure that the US Census Bureau uses when it's releasing its data, which we're about to get a lot more really rich data for the, from the 2020 census in the coming weeks. Um, so this was the unit of measure that we used um, for the assessment. Um, so just want to add that it um, abides by county borders, but as you can kind of see, it does not um, match up with um, city boundaries. Um, but um, returning back to our conversation on redlining, um, the so this is a zoom in on central Rochester, which of course, since Rochester is of course much larger than it was in the 30s um, and, cover, and covered a lot smaller area then. Um, but these um, sh kind of shapes that you see that are kind of a opaque white, those were the neighborhoods that were rated a C or a D. So those yellow and red lined neighborhoods um, in Rochester. And as we can see here, that's still where in central Rochester we see a, um, you know, more racial segregation in housing um, and where we see higher percentages of the residents who are who are BIPOC. Um, and I'll talk in a few minutes about how redlining we can still see impacts, you know, food security and life expectancy in the county today. And then looking to the future of Olmstead County, of course, um, you know, as is all, uh, most of Minnesota, um, Olmsted County is rapidly diversifying and becoming a, a more racially inclusive community, um, which I think is a really exciting future for the county. Um, and it also is a demographic shift that, yeah, as I'll talk in a few minutes, you know, we wanna make sure that the food system is prepared for um, so that we are eliminating disparities and not exacerbating um, existing ones that have been influenced by things such as redlining and other discriminatory practices and making sure that our, we're making our food system into something that is actively anti-racist. And switching gears for a brief moment uh, because you know racial segregation is not the only form of segregation and in fact uh, if you read through the assessment uh, we did some statistical analyses um, and you know got some data from the federal reserve that shows that actually Olmstead county is one of the less racially segregated counties in minnesota uh, however we applied the same statistics in our own analysis of economic segregation in the county um, so looking at you know rates of poverty and median household income and found that uh, actually Olmstead County is more economically segregated than it is racially segregated. Um, and as you can see on this map here that highlights the median household income within each census tract, um, we can see um, that pattern reflected here where we can see you know, in kind of central and eastern, the central and eastern core of Rochester, we see a lot more low income homes but then we also see concentrated affluence, uh, which is kind of a, a new concept that's been coming out of the field um, in planning and sociology and others, and actually uh, really got its uh, start at the University of Minnesota. Um, and so you can see that pocket, those two blue census tracts in the south, southwest of Rochester, where we can see that more affluent and wealthier households have segregated themselves into kind of these more closed off neighborhoods. And patterns like this, again, influence where retailers place grocery stores, again, um, where there might be better sidewalks and bus coverage and things like that. Um, so, you know, all of these things play a part in our food system. So what did we find uh, when we kind of crunched some of the numbers from the Census Bureau, from the state demo, dem, 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 demographers office from you know the state department of education you know and, and some of the county resources as well um so this is some, so this is something where it's i'm about to show like a bunch of maps and things which are very fun uh and if you go into um one of the links in the chat is for our interactive story maps which are still under construction but should be much more fleshed out um, by this time next week where you can really explore a lot of this data better than we could on you know the the 2d pieces of paper that are make up the uh the full report and assessment one thing we looked at of course was where are our grocery stores and how do those exist in relation to things such as income vehicle access you know ra uh, race and housing costs and things like that um which again is something you can uh i encourage you to explore um on those story maps in the coming days and weeks um so on this map for example we've mapped out the blue dots 
uh, are full-fledged grocery stores, you know, Kroger, Target, Hy-Vee, et cetera. And then those orange ones, because we want to think about all the different food sources that exist in Olmstead County, are, you know, convenience stores. They're Dollar General. They're Quick Trip. Um, your uh, specialty convenience stores and things like that. Um, and as we can see, just looking at this map at a very high level without some of the other data behind it, um, we can see that it's concentrated, of course, in some of the urban and suburban centers, which means that a lot of rural residents in Olmstead County, um, it's really difficult to get to a grocery store without, you know, taking a lot of time out of your day and week to drive 20 miles, 20 plus miles um, in order to get you know, fresh locally sourced or, you know, or just fresh food at all, whether or not it's locally sourced. Their food source, of course, that we looked at is food pantries, of which there are nine in Olmstead County, uh, including Channel One and its affiliates, um, seven of which, though, are in Rochester itself. So you can see, for example, in Stewartville, the closest uh, food pantry is, you know, on the southern end here, um, which is Channel One itself. Uh, and Channel One also, you know, does, you know, incredible, incredible work. And they've got, done some really amazing things in COVID and pivoting that I think have really started to serve as a regional and national model of how food pantries can change their work um, in the pandemic. Um, but also provides an example of, for, uh, as Andy mentioned, our transportation systems and how transportation interacts with the food system because, Channel One, for example, there are only two um, Rochester public transit bus routes that go past it, one of which does not run during the pantry's operating hours, and the other is just operates at the, you know, a.m. and p.m. rush hour peaks, um, and only two of the three evening runs of that bus go to Channel One at all. Um, so in order for someone who doesn't have a car to get to Channel One, they have to live near that bus route. Um, they have to be able to get on that first run um, and then shop, wait, and, and then wait 45 minutes for the next run to then go home. And that's just a lot of time out of our day. Um, but also it offers a really great opportunity for ways that, you know, folks such as everyone on this call and others in the community can come, can come together. And, you know, it's not, you know, a sexy solution, but can re really think through creative ways such as how can we adjust the bus schedule? Um, and the impact, the kind of domino effects that, you know, kind of, you know, quote unquote, simple interventions like that can have um, on making changes in the food system and improving people's food security. Pivot more into the analysis that we did. Um, when uh, a lot of times when we talk about food security, we're talking about food deserts, uh, which is, a, a, again, a USDA classification that looks at the proportion of people in a census tract who um, don't have easy access to a grocery store and the proportion of people who are considered low income. Um, so there are seven food deserts in Olmstead County, um, which, you know, in those just those seven tracts, which you can kind of see highlighted here, kind of going from um, northwest to southeast along that central spine there, um, those contain almost 19 percent of the county's population, actually. Um, but we discovered as we were kind of looking at other indicators of food security and food access that uh, in Olmstead County particularly, and this studies have shown this across the country, the food desert definition is really lacking because there's a lot that it does not capture. So for example, SNAP usage, uh, all formerly known as food stamps. Um, we can see, you know, for example, in the southeast corner here and in this tract around Stewartville, that's some of the highest SNAP usage in the county. Um, however, those aren't classified as food deserts. So if we're only looking at the food desert definition, we lose all of these households that are clearly struggling with food security but aren't you know, considered as living in a food desert. And another example, going back to transportation, is households who lack um, vehicle access, which again, this southeast corner here is an example of where we see something that clearly can lead to worse food access if you can't, even if you have a grocery store nearby, if it's across a four-lane highway and you can't drive to it, then you essentially, for yourself, live in a food desert. But the USDA definition um, doesn't fully capture that. So in order to have a more holistic view at the county and a more holistic idea of where to intervene with potentially limited resources, 
we decided to create our own prioritization index for the county. And we based it off of um, the disparities in life expectancy, because there isn't necessarily like one food insecurity like number that we can apply for each census tract. So we use life expectancy as kind of a proxy to see like what things that we know impact food security are also impacting how long people live. Um, because we can see, for example, in this central tract here in downtown Rochester, um, the average person in that tract is expected to only live to just over 65 years old. Um, and part of that is, you know, Mayo Clinic is located there and some senior centers. Um, but, you know, even outside of that, we see some tracts surrounding it where, you know, people are dying as young as 71. But then just a couple miles up the road in this, this dark purple tract that's outlined in white, um, the average resident there lives to almost 90 years old. So we have this huge 24 year disparity in how long people are living in Olmstead County compared to their neighbors. So we wanted to see what in the food system might be impacting that um, to really identify where like the most urgent needs could be. So we use nine indicators uh, having gone through the academic research. These are all indicators that have been shown time and time again, at least in the United States to impact food security and food access. So it's some of the ones we've already talked about, such as car access um, and food stores, SNAP, um, but also it's things like health insurance and our renters cost burden, meaning that they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing. Um, and then, you know, was it red redlined? What's the percentage of BIPOC residents? What's household income and what's the poverty rate? And together, these nine indicators explained 53% of the, that 24 year um, disparity and variation in life expectancy across the county. So obviously these aren't the entire picture, um, but there would be no way to get something that got to 100%, of course. Um, but it explains a lot of it and can really be used as like the key areas in the food system as well um, that can help improve people's life expectancy in Olmsted County. We brought those together into our index, um, and I won't go very deep on, on this. This is something that folks can explore um, on those story maps uh, in the coming weeks um, of where we saw kind of like the highest, you know, quote unquote, like risk um, using those nine indicators. So again, we can see things, you know, along, you know, a lot of those a lot of those food deserts, of course, um, but then also, again, those things, those places that weren't captured by the food desert definition, like in the southeast part of the city and Stewartville, um, and how with limited resources, we can really make sure to prioritize these areas and target our interventions in um, a lot of these tracks to make sure that we're getting essentially the most bang for our buck. So getting bang for our buck, what are some of the key takeaways and calls to action that we found from this assessment? The verse is kind of a, a paradigm shift. Um, and thinking about food insecurity as a public health issue rather than just like a nutritional one. Um, and that it's a, you know, ta tackling food insecurity um, as well as all of its intersections in income, transportation, housing, land use, childcare, zoning, budgets, programs, all of these things, and really looking at all of them with a public health lens and thinking through the ways that our policies are impacting um, the health of ourselves, um, our neighbors, and our communities. Um, as well, something in, in this public health aspect that we that I found was kind of lacking in some of the literature was making sure that our local farmers are at the table. Uh, I, don't, I didn't get into it during this presentation, but we have a section in the assessment on local farmers in Olmstead County. Um, particularly with how climate change is going to impact our local farmers um, and making sure that they are at the table is going to be tantamount over the coming years. As well as kind of moving beyond the traditional framing of food deserts, we also need to move beyond what are thought of as, you know, kind of quote unquote traditional interventions, which has often been like food desert, throw a grocery store in it, see what happens. And study after study and grocery store after grocery store has shown that just merely throwing a grocery store in a food desert doesn't work. Um, you, know, you know, for example, if you don't increase the pe people's wages, uh, the folks who live there, they still can't afford to shop at the store, even if they can walk to it. So that means that our interventions, we have to get creative and they have to be intentional, transparent, inclusive, and folks who are currently experiencing food insecurity need to be at the table and centered in these conversations and helping set the agenda. 
um, as well as making sure that food insecure people who don't qualify for government assistance, such as SNAP, WIC, SSI, et cetera, um, are not falling through the cracks just because they're like, you know, they're not getting um, this government assistance. Well, returning back to you know the the racial hunger gap and income segregation that exists today in Olmstead County, as the county continues to grow and diversify, we want to make sure that all of our interventions and new policies and programs um, are taking a proactive and hands-on approach to make sure that existing inequities and disparities are eliminated rather than exacerbated um, as the county continues to shift. Um, and again, centering that racial hunger gap as well. So the you'll see in the assessment that we have 34 recommend, recommended strategies um, that have already been tried in communities across the country. Um, you'll see that there are four on this map that are specifically highlighted um, because uh, Rochester's comprehensive plan for 2040 um, did a policy comparison with um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Boulder, Colorado, Iowa City, Iowa, and Madison, Wisconsin. And so we wanted to do the same thing for kind of consistency across um, planning and policy documents in the county. Um, so we did a deep dive on current food systems policies and programs in those four communities, and then also looked across the country at things that other communities um, we're doing. And I really encourage folks to go in, read what these other communities are doing, and think through how we can apply those same strategies in Olmstead County um, to really have creative solutions um, to some of these wicked problems in food security. So I'm really going to highlight um, kind of our, you know, the, the assessment advisory panel, kind of the, uh, the top three kind of like quick and you know quick strategies that can be implemented relatively quickly and can then help again that domino effect to then help other recommendations strategies and pivots um, down the road and the first we're doing right now uh, with all of you in this room is establishing a food security coalition um, to implement the assessments recommendations guide future policy and also allow a lot of our you know, food providers and governments and schools and community members to coordinate so that resources are fully utilized um, and are meeting the gaps that are been identified by the data in this. Um, and I believe that uh, Anna is going to talk more later about uh, how you can join and get started in some of this work. As well, a lot of this is sometimes just comes down to staffing and is there someone who can do who's getting paid to do the work and has the time to do it. Um, so something that communities such as Madison and Iowa City are doing is that they have a full time county food systems coordinator um, who coordinates a lot of this work and is kind of the uh, the institutional knowledge across organizations so that organizations can do the day the day the day to day food security work of getting food on people's tables. And then this person can really look in that long term kind of policy uh, solutions um, and make sure that everyone is coordinated. And then as well, and I know I highlighted an example with bus schedules, um, but tra the transportation system actually offers some you know, relatively easy wins when it comes to food security. Um, so it's things again, like looking at the bus routes and roads and you know traffic light signals outside of grocery stores even, um, but also conducting you know, a sidewalk gap analysis such as the one conducted in Emporia, Kansas, that specifically looked at food sources and whether or not they had enough adequate sidewalks and then creating funding prioritization around that side or filling those sidewalk gaps. So I think I'm a little bit over time, um, but I'm excited um, for the rest of what we'll be talking about today. Um, so for more information on the assessment itself, again, I believe Anna dropped some of these links in the chat where you can look not just at the full assessment, but also um, at some of the data maps. And if you really want to get uh, in the weeds on it, a lot of the academic research and studies that were cited in this work as well. Um, once again, yeah, I just want to acknowledge, um, thank you to the advisory panel who really um, let me kind of take this and run with it uh, and gave me a lot of a leeway and a lot of support um, in putting this together. Um, and then if you have any questions, you know, on the assessment or anything else, my contact information is here uh, as well as Anna's as well. Um, and with that, I believe I will hand it back over to Anna to introduce our next presentation. 
Yes, thank you so much, Matthew, for this, um, for your uh, report and, and sharing your findings with everyone today. Um, next, we would like to hear from Channel One, um, and they will be um, informing us of a wonderful co-design experience that they have recently um, wrapped up in Olmsted County and are working with other counties across Southeast Minnesota to hear and collect qualitative data from individuals who are experiencing food insecurity um, firsthand and using, hearing these voices to make sound informed decisions moving forward. So I will turn this over now to Channel One to share their findings with us. Thank you. Hey, Anna, do we have Jess Roberts on the line? I am looking at our participants um, and I not seeing his name. Um, wondering if um, Jennifer Belial, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind pinch hitting here um, and discussing the co-design process since I know you were deeply involved with Jess in that as well. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I can. I'm going to just um, root around on my computer for a document. It'll be just a second. So while Jennifer is rooting around, hi, Virginia Merritt, Executive Director at Channel One. I'm here at the Rochester Area Foundation with some um, Feeding America guests that we um, have in town. So the co-design process really started because we wanted to understand the community better and then this group agreed to let that be the qualitative um, analysis um, from from the um, the assessment that uh, Matthew and um, and Kelly led um, and so really we were able to find some co-designers folks who've maybe experienced hunger or just deeply ingrained in underrepresented communities and then Jess from the University of Minnesota Center for Design was able to really go deep with them and um, under and understand more about how we can better serve the underserved in our community. Thanks, Virginia. So it was a very iterative process. Um, for those of you who were a part of the um, the process for Discovery Square, it was the same um, co-design work and the same sort of outline for, for uh, engaging the community. And the idea is to find individuals who are highly impacted but have little influence and little um, traditional voice, not the, the kind of people that would typically show up for a meeting or typically come to a town hall. And they did the work by um, leaning in with their own experiences, but then also talking to people that staff at Channel One, staff at other community partners might not have a chance to have a deep conversation with and have a frank conversation with. So the guiding principles um, the themes that came out of the work and the themes were just kind of using as a as a way station um, to describe the work. Um, and then the guiding principles that came out of those conversations were also still fleshing out. Um, but the first guide, the first theme was the dignity and worthiness and how so many people who come to food shelves and other food access programs um, feel like they shouldn't be in the position, feel like they need to show up with um, some um, certain behaviors like gratitude or, or um, um, shouldn't be needing the assistance or needing the food. And we heard often, um, I don't wanna take food from someone else. I don't wanna be in this position. This is very embarrassing to be here. Um, we also heard that um, one bad experience would um, really influence somebody's um, perception of going and using food resources for quite a long period of time. We heard things like people who would 
go through the self-check outline with their SNAP EBT cards because they didn't want to hold up the line behind them um, because sometimes it would take longer to check out with that, with that benefit and they didn't want the people behind them in line to know. So some of the guiding principles that came out of that is um, people really want a hand up, not a hand out when they come to a food program. They want to be made to feel normal. Um, and if there was ways that we could sort of normalize getting food assistance into the community. Um, people don't want to feel rushed while they're getting their food or picking out their food. People want an opportunity to shop and choose, um, bring their families if they can, um, learn about the foods that they are um, receiving. And a big shout out to Melena and her work uh, as a SNAP ed educator, helping with the videos and the recipes and the education around unfamiliar foods. Um, people really want to contribute. They want to see themselves when they go to food programs. So ways that people could either give back or contribute maybe with their labor um, or other experiences. It also helps some individuals feel like um, they're welcome in a place because they are learning about it by um, 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 participating in it. The welcome is very important and the, the intrusiveness of many of the questions that we ask um, is highly uncomfortable for people. Um, so having an opportunity to explain ahead of time um, what information we're gonna need, why we're gonna need it, and then asking the minimum amount of information to access food is very important. Um, for many people in the BIPOC community, um, those questions around why are you here makes people feel like they are at legal risk if they're not um, welcome in the community because they're not full citizens in the community. Um, and then some of those questions and some of that intrusiveness makes people feel like, um, frankly, that, that, they're, that they're stealing food. Um, and we've heard that at, at the Channel One Food Shelf, your old system of checking us out at the door and asking questions about how much food we were receiving, how many people in our household, you made us feel like we were stealing and we don't wanna come back again. Accessible and schedule is very important to people. Um, working families need an opportunity to access food and that's not just um, at the end of the workday, um, so not just the traditional nine to five hours of operation, but then also um, the way people are accessing their food. Um, as Matthew said, some people are going to want to come and shop. Some people are gonna want food delivered. Um, we all know that from our own experience. Some of us did um, DoorDash during the pandemic. Some of us are still getting grocery delivery. Some of us are doing curbside pickup and people, um, around the community want to partake in those options as well. Um, the, another issue with access is the amount of food. Many traditional food programs, um, you, could, you could access them once a month. And um, for, for a lot of people, that means that fresh food wasn't available because fresh food isn't gonna last in your refrigerator. Um, some people might not have a large storage area or a large refrigerator. So um, accessing smaller amounts of food frequently um, can be very important. Um, and um, trying to make sure that um, we're not forcing foods on people. And I say that very humbly because Channel One at the start of the pandemic was boxing food and telling people you can drive through our parking lot and pick up a box of food. And that was very uncomfortable for people. They wanna know what they're receiving and they wanna choose their, their, um, the, the foods that they're providing to their family. Access to information um, is incredibly important. And, um, People need to be met where they're at. And I think sometimes we forget that um, our social media channels and our communication channels are, are um, geared more toward a, a different audience. So finding um, messages that are 
um, really digestible and really straightforward for people of various communities. I'd like to just lean in and shout out to the Orinoco Food Shelf. They've been using their social media channels to just give people information about what food's available, when they're open, and kind of normalizing things. They did a great job this summer with, hey, we're putting together barbecue kits around a couple of the holidays because we know you want to have a, an outdoor cookout for your family. And so you're welcome to come to the food shop and get those ingredients. Um, information should be proactively shared when we make changes to our programs, we make changes to our food system, people don't always know about that. And I say that very humbly as well because people still ask me about the very old Channel One food shelf because that's the experience that they might've had three or four years ago and don't understand that um, our, our methods have changed and our operation have changed. So being proactive about telling people when we make changes in the community. And then anything that we can do to provide information before people show up so that when they show up, they feel like this is a place for us. We've heard stories about some members of the community, especially immigrants who are so overwhelmed at going to a new place um, that just coming to our parking lot and sitting in our parking lot is all they can manage for a day. And taking that extra step to come inside to know that it's a place for them is something that is very overwhelming. So figuring out ways to provide that, that support. Choice and autonomy is very important. Um, people want their individual needs met around their own personal health. Um, their own personal preferences, their own cultures. Um, so anything that we can do to make choice available. And as I said earlier, choice isn't just um, choosing between green beans or peas or choosing between applesauce or canned pears. It's choosing the amount of food. It's choosing the types of food. It's choosing how I get my food, when I get my food. And it's also includes who I'm feeding, um, who I consider part of my food household. Um, we know in some communities, um, families are serving a, a wider um, um, cultural family or maybe um, a, a wider group of people in their neighborhood. And so we've learned at Channel One, we don't say, well, who do you live with? Meaning who's on your lease or who's in your household? We say, who are you feeding today? And we get a very different answer. Um, and that makes a very um, big distinction to a lot of families. Providing transitions to people, providing food and support and information to people when they're in life transitions. So that transition between being a young adult still in school and then heading out on your own um, as, a, as a younger person, that is really big. Um, and then also transitions as people are in and out of the workforce and finishing up their careers and learning to manage their budgets and manage their households in a different way um, is very important. Um, investment in youth is a very unique theme in Olmsted County that we haven't heard in other communities. Um, we have a tremendously strong youth network in our community. We have very resilient, very smart, very active young people at Rochester Public and other schools. And I don't think we as a, as a community of support rely on them to lead the way as much as we could. Um, they are bridging the gap in many cultures between um, older family members, um, older generations who maybe don't speak English or maybe aren't as familiar with North American culture. Um, they're also providing support to younger family members. And um, so really relying on young people to help choose the food for the family, um, pick what they would like, have some more autonomy. Um, and other than maybe giving them car keys and having them deliver food, really leaning on them to support the food distribution network and the food support network around the community. 
Um, building and developing confidence and trust was another important theme. And I'm going to be honest, it was a very controversial theme. Um, some members of the Black community um, are, are tired of needing to stand up and educate um, the Jennifers of this world about what they need and how to welcome them and how to support them. And that burden of building trust on them can feel overwhelming. Um, but to that, we do need to remember and be mindful of making sure, again, that people see themselves in the program, um, see themselves in the community, see themselves um, by offering the food supports, the types of um, food, and then the interactions that are important to them. So there's also some opportunities, I think, for us to um, work on rebuilding trust with the community and restoring trust with the community by saying all are welcome here with this food. And when we get it wrong, when we do the wrong thing, when we say, wait, how much food are you taking? Um, who are you feeding? And offend somebody that we make it right, right that we restore that relationship. And we, we figure out ways to continue to welcome people. Um, so some of that bystander to upstander style training is very important. Um, and then leveraging people with lived experiences through co-design conversations through other resources to make sure that they feel welcome. Um, storage and preparation, there's a lot of um, anxiety and a lot of um, frustration sometimes at the bulk kinds of food that we have available, um, typically in the food network. Um, here at Channel One, much of our food is um, USDA commodities, and so it'll be larger packages of frozen meat. And if you're a, a mother um, trying to source food for your family at the end of a long day, having a frozen chicken to take home at 5.30 isn't something that you can make a meal with. So being mindful of um, not just a grocery delivery model, like a traditional food shelf, but thinking about ways that I mean, we all think about how many meals that we eat out or how many meals that somebody else prepares for us. Um, how can we extend that to um, the, the people in need in our community as well? Um, and then again, those, those ways of learning about um, unfamiliar ingredients. And for those of us who are decision makers, making sure that we're looking for the types of food and sourcing the foods that are gonna be easy, to prepare, nutritious to prepare, and really welcoming for people. That was really high level, very fast, very on the fly. What questions do you all have for me? Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, before we move on to questions for either Jennifer or Matthew, I would just like to reiterate that the, the top recommendation from this assessment is that a local Olmsted County food security collaborative effort um, be started. And so uh, that's what we would like to invite you to participate in. I will put a link in the chat here uh, for a little form if you would like to be a part of this movement, if you would like to join this group and hear more, learn more and work together. Um, we will be following up with everybody about future meetings and information. Um, so while I put that in the chat, um, I would like everybody to, or invite everybody to stick around for some discussion. Um, we can have some Q&A here. I know there's a few questions in the chat already that I will, will direct. All right, so one question early in the chat, and I believe Matthew, um, what is the metric or process for measuring or estimating food insecurity? Yeah, great yeah. question. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, so the metric that the USDA uses for their official food insecurity classification um, is from a, a survey um, that they send out. I don't remember if it's yearly. I don't, I don't remember the time frame on it, uh, unfortunately. Um, but so it's a survey sent out to a sample of households 
um, you know, per county across the United States um, that has a series of questions that the USDA has kind of refined over time. Um, and if folks want to look at that, I can find that list of questions and put it in the chat. Um, and then they use the answers to those questions to then estimate um, the percentage of uh, households and individuals in each county in the United States that are um, food insecure based off of the, those answers. Thank you. Um, another question that was in the chat was wondering about why the Asian population was not included in the BIPOC data shown. Um, I'm wondering if that maybe was the slide with the individual people, noting the number of one in four, one in five um, individuals um, who are food insecure. Yeah, another another great question. Um, and that is just, it wasn't in the Feeding America report on um, and that comes from some of their COVID food insecurity. Um, so yeah, I've only got the ones that they that they put there. Um, and I, but I can, if folks are interested, I can see if I can find if they've got it maybe listed like deep in some report. It just wasn't in. Uh, if I just didn't, um, if it wasn't in the executive summary, um, if folks are interested in that later. Thank you. And then another, the last question that we have in the chat, and I welcome more questions. You can feel free to unmute yourself or place them in the chat um, during our discussion now, um, was a question about the cultural demographics of the regions. So wondering about uh, the cultural demographics in the regions where the life expectancy is 85 to uh, 89 years of age um, versus some of the other other uh, census tract with a, a shorter life, uh, estimated life expectancy. Yeah, that is that is a, um, a really interesting question, and I think I think it was from Amanda, um, and and one that you know um, didn't dive into a ton, but yeah, we see it's a lot of you know it's income um, is a huge a huge part of it. Um, I did not do as much age breakdown uh, in this assessment as as I think would have been necessary. It just we just kind of ran out of out of time to um, to do that. In addition, um, but so that's something that I'm really hoping that you know folks who might have more experience with um, you know e each of these these neighborhoods uh, you know going forward and like going through some of the story maps and things, which will have some of those age breakdowns um, in addition to race. Um, and income and how those things are all influencing that. But yeah, um, for those specifically, the ones that we looked at, um, race was a big influencer, income, particularly I believe poverty rate and housing costs, um, because they're, they have, there's wild variation in housing costs um, within Olmstead County, uh, as in every um, community in the country really, um, were some of the big ones. And then, um, whether or not the neighborhood was historically redlined um, is still actually looking at some of the statistical analysis, a, a big part um, in the disparity in life expectancy. Thank you, Matthew. Um, those are the questions that I found and, and uh, took from the chat, but I would welcome any other questions at this time for either Matthew or Jennifer. Yes, Hi. I see you. Hi, Anna. Hi, Chris. Good Hi. to see you. Thank you. Hi. Go ahead with your question. Uh, sure. I'm Chris Brown. Uh, I run a nonprofit urban farm in Rochester. Uh, I uh, I know you're just, it was kind of a summary, but, um, and I was trying to kind of comb through your, the full report here, but, um, I didn't hear you mention specifically how uh, phys physical disability uh, factored into the assessment. Could you talk a little bit about that, Matthew? Yes, I am so glad you asked this question. Thank you, Chris. Um, because yes, um, disability plays a huge role in food access and food security. Um, we do not have um, like, you know, the kind of granular census tract um, 
data on food security outside of SNAP um, households because they collect that information for SNAP households, so we don't have it for the population um, at large. Um, but yeah, but there is a section in the in the assessment is more of like a narrative section, kind of breaking down some of the literature um, and previous research done on disability and food access. Um, but yes, that is yeah, disability justice um, is also uh, yeah and, yeah I and uh, yeah we just didn't have a chance to highlight it in the presentation today, but it's also a huge part of of food justice. Um, you know. Things that, and, and plays into some of the things we also talked about, such as adequate sidewalks. You know, if you use a mobility aid, such as a wheelchair or a walker, um, but the sidewalks at the grocery store down the street from you either don't exist or are full of holes, um, then you can't really, it's very difficult to get to the grocery store. Um, so yes, yeah, disability is a huge, huge part of food access. Um, and I, I wish that there was more data on it because of how um, integral it is to having an equitable food system. So yeah, th thank you. Thank you for that, uh, for that question, Chris. Thank you. And Joanne, I see your hand is raised. I would like to just ask a question about the schools. The schools played such a huge important part during COVID and feeding people. And Many of the schools have uh, implemented pantries at school, and I'm wondering if we have it documented where all of the school pantries are. Um, yeah, that is not, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, schools are, were a huge part of the COVID response, and honestly, we're do and well, the some a lot of the school systems in Olmstead even before COVID were doing some really creative things. I'm thinking particularly like Dover Iota's um, food truck that the students run. Um, but to your question, uh, Joanne, yeah, I at least when I was doing the research was not able to find any like publicly accessible data on school food pantries. I don't know if maybe Channel One or someone else might um, have more information on that um, than than I would at this moment. Um, but yeah, I was not able to find that when doing this. Um, but it's a great question because they are so integral to our communities. And I think that would be um, a, one of the many next steps, immediate next steps of the Food Security Coalition would be to um, gather that type of, of granular local information to um, inform future work. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Andy, I see your hand is raised as well. Yeah, thank you. I was I had a question for Jennifer. Um, I mean, these are really powerful insights that you shared, and I'm just wondering. I'd love to hear more about um, whether or how you might share them widely with folks who are um, who are colleagues or who have food shelves here and everywhere. Because it seems like it's um, this is a really powerful insights that you brought. Yeah. So Channel One is doing the work in um, several of the counties that we support. We support food shelves and food access in 14 counties, and we've got co-design cohorts working in five of them. Um, and really thanks to our, our colleagues at IMAA and Diversity Council who said, if you're going to do this work, you really need to show up in Rochester the same way. Um, we, we Channel One has a large impact impact in, in Rochester and Olmstead County as it re in relation to some of our other communities, but we still want to show up in the same way, um, especially work with um, communities of color. So we're hot off the presses. We've just finished our co-design cohorts, and now we are taking this back to um, food shelves and our traditional food partners and our emerging food partners to say, this is what we've heard from the community. How can we take these principles and then turn them into actionable items for our food shelves and for our food programs? One um, emerging theme, and again, that, that information, that access to information, we're learning that just a, a client bill of rights um, and maybe something a little more low key than that. So people know, here's what I can expect at a food shelf. Here's what um, is important to me at a food shelf. Um, I need to know what I'm going to be asked, how I can access this food. 
Um, so we're going to be working on that. And we're working with some regional partners um, at the state, um, our, our DHS partners that administer TFAP, um, our colleagues at other food banks, and um, Foundation for Essential Needs as well. Great, thank you. And just want to mention um, that the, the food truck is with um, Byron, but Carrie Frank with Dover Yoda Public Schools is also doing wonderful, fantastic farm to school work as well in their community. So thank you for, for that clarification in the chat. Um, other questions? thoughts, feedback. Um, we were planning on doing some breakout rooms around this time, but I, I feel like we have rich discussion right now here as well. So please feel free to keep the questions coming. If there aren't any further questions at the moment, um, we just want to thank you again so much for your time um, and your listening ears today, joining us in this um, conversation. Um, again, we will be following up with this meeting with the recording of the meeting, as well as links to all the documents that we've mentioned, as well as the link to uh, join this new Olmsted County Food Security Collaborative. Um, we hope to hear more from you. We hope to keep this conversation going. As Matthew mentioned, this is only the beginning and there's a lot of work to be done um, and we are excited to do that work together. Um, so we thank you again for your, your time and your participation. Special thanks to Matthew and Jennifer as well for your time and presentations today. We will um, hang out on the line if there's other further questions, but um, welcome you all to go about your productive and busy days. Thank you very much for, for joining us today.